Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you, Christian. I'm, I'm delighted to have this opportunity to share some aspects about our journey toward making uh, biochar available for Canada, for the Canadian marketplace, and our plans for expanding production capability uh, in Canada. AirTerra is committed to fully using both the energy and the carbon associated with biomass feedstocks. So I'll trace my, our journey uh, from small scale to a larger scale on this. A few words about feedstocks, production, application practices for biochar. And a final word about how, how we see bioenergy with CCS and biochar transitioning in the future. AirTerra exists to provide solutions to several coinciding problems and opportunities. There's currently an overload of CO2 in Earth's atmosphere, as you know. At the same time, soil carbon <clears throat> has been depleted worldwide as a result of modern mechanized farming practices. Along with this, Earth's population has increased dramatically, resulting in co a corresponding energy and building boom. We believe bioenergy with biochar production and soil amendment and its use as a building product ingredient will be one of the many methods of offsetting past and present fossil carbon emissions. Nature is signaling a solution for these problems. <clears throat> Each year during the Northern Hemisphere summer cycles, photosynthesis by plants reduces the global CO2 concentration by about seven parts per million. However, each winter when plants do not grow as quickly in the Northern Hemisphere, the CO2 concentration increases by 10 parts per million to result in an annual net CO2 increase of up to three parts per million. A large portion of this CO2 increase is due to global, globally decomposing biomass. Is it possible to convert enough biomass into stable carbon products for agriculture and building materials to help stabilize our global CO2 concentrations? AirTerra intends to help resolve these problems by cooperating with nature. Captured carbon can be sequestered into soils and building materials such as concrete and asphalt, while also making use of biomass energy. AirTerra was founded in 2009 with a vision to bring biochar making clean cooking stoves to small shareholder farmers in Kenya and other African countries. We met Dr. Paul Anderson at an international biochar conference in 2009. Paul Anderson provided biochar stove training with funding secured by AirTerra for Salim Shaban, a small shareholder farmer in Kenya. I was inspired by the great, the recent uh, Green Carbon webinar uh, featuring similar work done by Cecilia Sonnenberg, along with support from Paul Anderson. And this issue, the, the issues described in the webinar were <laughs> like those we had experienced. We introduced a new technology to help families in developing nations avoid indoor air pollution that causes millions of deaths annually, while improving energy efficiency, which, was, which has resulted in conserving wood, reducing deforestation, improving crop yields, and reducing labor. Of course, as Paul can attest, it's not, not without its difficulties as well. And also uh, Cecilia had mentioned a number of the difficulties associated with that. Today, AirTerra is helping gardeners and farmers in Alberta to enhance their soils. Our biochar is screened into three grades. Fines, less than two millimeter as a future animal feed ingredient. Medium, two to six millimeters, perfect for soil compost blending. And coarse, six millimeters plus, effective as a water filtration medium. As you know, biochar remains in soils for hundreds to thousands of years. It creates excellent soil conditions that stimulate beneficial soil microbes for plant health. And each ton of biochar amended to the soils stores the equivalent of about 2.3 tons of CO2 drawn out of the atmosphere. Because of the CO2 removal benefits of biochar, demand is beginning to grow exponentially with the recent support of carbon credit of, of carbon credit systems in the USA and in the EU. In addition, companies like Microsoft, Google, Facebook, and Apple are likely to lend their support to these products. 
Eritrea's biochar is registered with the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, the CFIA. The point of this slide is just to highlight the claims the CFIA allows us to make on our retail label. Eritrea's biochar is made from sustainable forest industry residuals as shown here. In addition to forest industry residual wood, Eritrea will consider harvesting of the trees removed for pruning to construct fire guard zones, fire suppression thinned forests, cut lines, and the clearing of land for development. Essentially, no woody fiber should be allowed to simply decompose in landfills, slash piles, and stockpiles. I totally agree with uh, Peter Oliver, who spoke at the last Green Carbon webinar series on why biochar isn't big. <clears throat> that small scale biochar production is not beneficial for the environment in that it wastes 70% of the thermodynamically available value of the, the, the energy value of the biomass. It, create, it generates excessive greenhouse gases in the process, results in inferior biochar quality, has a higher labor cost, whether you count your labor or not, has human health implications, and is a slow way to adopt biochar use in general throughout the world. The process Air Terra is proposing will involve pyrolysis at a temperature of 400 to 600 degrees C in a manner that will generate flammable hydrogen, carbon monoxide, methane, and incondensable hydrocarbons, along with bio oils and solid carbon biochar with a high fixed carbon content and a low ash content. Our currently planned biochar plant will require 60 tons per day of woody feed biomass feedstock and will generate 10 tons or more per day of biochar. The syngas components will be used to provide heat for the process as well as enough excess energy to power a 1.5 megawatt electrical power generator with additional available heat for drying incoming feedstock and for building heat. Alternatively, there is a future potential to condense the liquids from the syngas to generate liquid biofuels. Alberta is an ideal province to serve as an anchor location to demonstrate the potential to make use of the re residual biomass as a source of carbon for agricultural inputs and for soil remediation. The forest zones are well distributed along the western half of Alberta as well as the northern half. Agriculture is distributed in the southeast and northwestern and central areas of Alberta. <clears throat> Oil and gas and oil sands <clears throat> sites are currently, that currently need to be claimed, reclaimed. <clears throat> are distributed throughout Alberta. We are working towards a, a, a locally made and locally used biochar supply and distribution chain. A few words about biochar application methods. I cringe whenever I see these early biochar application photos uh, from around 2009, where pristine biochar was simply broadcasted onto land in fields, field trials that were later deemed to be relatively ineffective or had delayed benefits. Biochar does not contain significant nutrients and will initially absorb, adsorb nutrients. So when amended into nutrient deficient soils, there could actually be a negative crop yield impact for the first year or so until the biochar has reached its nutrient storage capacity. Simple answer is don't do this in either research studies or in practice. The very best practice is to use, uh, uh, is to co-compost co biochar with either municipal or organic or, or agricultural organics. I became convinced of this as a best practice after reading a paper written by Nicholas Hegeman and co with co-authors Stephen Joseph and Hans Peter Schmidt and a number of other contributors in Nature Communications published in October 2017 entitled Organic Coatings on Biochar Explains Its Nutrient Retention and Stimulation of Soil Fertility. They used a suite of methods including scanning electron microscopy or SEM to arrive at its 
fulsome, uh, at this fulsome conclusion based on a work conducted at the University of Saskatchewan's Canadian Light Source Facility. SEM was used to image nutrient co nutrients coating every particle of co-composted biochar. This paper was foundational in providing direction for Airterra's current recommendations on best practices for biochar application. Another highly promising method of biochar application is in the form of air seedable pellets that are combined with a green manure from a cattle feedlot in Alberta. The company Earth Renew has just recently announced a significant and scalable manufacturing plant in Alberta for this project. This could also be a game changer for the use of biochar in commercial agriculture as it reduces the amount of biochar needed to achieve significant crop yield enhancements for organic precision input farming. They will vastly, this will vastly improve the economics for end users and expand biochar's pop popularity as an industrial agricultural input. Airtera is also promoting the use of biochar as a co-composting ingredient for animal bedding and municipal source separated organics. This slide shows a few photos of our early work with farmers who are using biochar for this purpose. As such, biochar is used in a stacked function manner where it first serves to improve bedding conditions for animal health and their value, and odor issues in barns, followed by enhance, enhancing the nutrient and microbiological value of the co-composted spent bedding. Carterra is currently working with both agricultural customers and, site reclam and the site reclamation industry in several and several others listed here on this slide. This photo is of a research trial near Prince Albert, Saskatchewan on a former heavy oil recovery site. In addition to biochar for soil amendment, the quality of biocarbon generated by our proposed process will allow for additional possible building material products listed in this, in this slide. I would like to conclude with one additional topic involving two methods of carbon dioxide removal, uh, or CDR. Method one is a bioenergy capture and sequestration, bioenergy carbon capture, carbon dioxide capture and sequestration, or what's called VEX. With this method, biomass, residual wood in the form of wood pellets, are used in place of fossil coal to generate renewable electricity. What distinguishes it from, con from conventional bioenergy is the additional capture of the carbon dioxide that is emitted from fully combusting the wood fuel. An example of a proposed VEX scheme is the Drax power plant in the UK. Method two is bioenergy with biochar or biocarbon production, or what I call BEB. With this method, Residual wood is used again to generate electrical power, but under oxygen starved conditions, making use of thermal chemical conversion processes to simultaneously generate electricity and a high carbon content biochar, rather than combusting the wood all the way to ash. Now let's look at the thermodynamic costs associated with generating electricity with these two methods. And uh, Dr. Uh, Hugh McLaughlin commented on this in the last one of the previous uh, green carbon webinars, uh, uh, and uh, it goes like this. 70% of the thermodynamically available biomass energy can be realized by, by use as useful energy or electrical power and or heat. And the other 30% of the available biomass energy is either used to capture CO2 for the geological sequestration in VEX or in the form of biochar recovery for soil amendment or for soil enhancement in BEB. There, there are an important set of questions we need to ask about these bio-based bio -based carbon dioxide removal methods. One, how much biomass is required to achieve significant CDR levels? And what impact will these bio-based bio bio carbon dioxide removal methods have on our forests? For example, Drax Group of the UK 
is in the process of converting all of their UK power generation plants from fossil coal as a fuel to residual wood. They are claiming that these power plants will eventually be equipped with CO2 capture facility capacity to enable full BEX. <clears throat> At a November 20 Atlantic Council meeting, Will Gardner, CEO of Drax, stated that on a global basis, only 1% of all available sustainably harvested and residual fiber, if used for electrical power production with CCS, could contribute to four gigatons of annual uh, per annum of negative emissions. This would be equal to the total current aviation industry emissions. I've provided a link um, for that interview in my slide. To accomplish this massive power production uh, fuel conversion, Drax has been busy buying and securing contracts for residual forest industry materials in Canada and the USA. Well, Will Gardner stated that 20% of the fuel for Drax, for the Drax fuel conversion will come from Canada 60% from the USA and the other 20% from other countries. In February of 2021, Drax has now purchased the largest residual forest wood maker of pellets in Western Canada, uh, Pinnacle Renewable Energy. A link to a YouTube video that reports on this, this yet to be finalized purchase is provided. Concomitantly, the IBI has a stated goal of promoting the generation of 1 million tons of biochar per annum, which is the equivalent of removing 2.3 gigatons of CO2 from the atmosphere yearly. However, large scale BECs will be faster to implement because it is not tied to consumer markets as the CO2 is simply injected into geological formations. Moreover, CO2 capture is accomplished at a slightly lower cost with BECs. BEB, on the other hand, can only scale as quickly as consumers are willing to purchase the biochar products produced by the process. In addition to the importance of creating awareness to grow the biochar market, biochar offset credits are an important enabler to reduce biochar's cost to consumers. Only recently have organizations like uh, European Biochar, <clears throat> Puro Earth, and soon to be Vera in North America, begun to offer biochar offset certificates to enable this. <clears throat> we have yet to experience a full, the full impact of these recently available carbon credits on the rate of uptake of biochar as a consumer product. Whether BEX or BEB are to become prevalent technologies for CDR, <clears throat> a great amount of attention will need to be directed to ensuring sustainable forest practices are followed and regulated. Minimum dam damage to forest biodiversity needs to be assured, limiting the, limiting the destruction of soil or organisms, bacteria and fungi in below the ground level. Harvesting and land use changes must be accounted for not only must account for not only the removal of about, above, above ground trees, but also the damage done to below ground carbon. All feedstocks will need to be sourced from sustainable forestry and waste wood collection. Sustainable forestry must be defined as practices that ensure forests are constantly increasing over time in carbon content. There are, however, considerable concerns about clear cutting changes, changes in land use and the introduction of monocultures and same age trees, which can all contribute to disease vulnerabilities, wildfires, and the loss of below ground soil carbon sinks. All peripheral activities, including harvesting, material handling, pelletizing, transportation and storage system will require co close attention to account for carbon intensity, the carbon intense, uh, intensity of those activities. In conclusion, biocarbon and biochar demand <clears throat> is beginning to grow exponentially. With the recent support of carbon credit systems in the USA and, e and the U EU, as well as recent carbon offset demand generated by companies like Microsoft, Google, and Apple. Biochar and biocarbon are useful products that will eventually find a place serving multiple functions, such as soil enhancement, strengthening of building materials, and carbon sequestration. These products will generate many spin-off 
economic benefits for farming, forestry, the built environment, energy industries, and the, nat and the natural environment. It seems that bioenergy with geological CCS or um, as, a seed, as a carbon dioxide removal method will initially grow faster than bioenergy with biochar production. But I'm confident that even BEX will pivot to bioenergy with biochar in the long term, moving from full combustion of, to, a, to a pyrolysis uh, process to supply an ever-growing biochar market. And with that, I'm now open to any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Robert. Thank you for your presentation. And you got a couple of questions already. Um, so the first one was from Amara Dar, um, asking about uh, if you use your biochar in agriculture, and what type of results uh, are you getting in terms of crop production? We're 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 seeing um, farmers that are very happy with. Uh, not only uh, increases in yield, but increases in quality. So for example, um, one of our farmers has applied biochar to their forage crops and uh, all the dairies that use his forage crops around, the, around uh, in his local area uh, can't get enough of his, uh, of his hay to, to feed uh, cows for, uh, because of the protein content in the milk going up. So it's not just a yield increase, it's also a plant health benefit uh, and resistance to disease and those sorts of things. So it's actually quite difficult to quantify. And at this point, there's not enough uh, uh, users uh, uh, generating the, the actual practical, you know, the practice of biochar application to their farms. We need to see that uh, uh, in much larger quantities, but um, initial results are very promising. Uh, thank you. And then um, you got a, a, a question from Soyoung Choi. Um, geological carbon sequestration means that Viager captures the carbon dioxide when they are amended. I think there was a um, confusion about the difference between BEX and Viager. Yeah, so BEX, uh, bioenergy with carbon, carbon dioxide capture and sequestration is a direct um, process where carbon dioxide is captured from the flue gas. Uh, generated from burning uh, biomass. And then that CO2 is compressed and sent, sent down a pipeline to a place where it can be geologically sequestered. So it's a completely different process <clears throat> from bio, bioenergy and biochar. With bioenergy and biochar, the plant itself captures carbon dioxide using photosynthesis. And once you have generated electricity in a pyrolytic process, you fix carbon as a solid product coming from the, the, pyrolyt, from the power generation process. And that fixed carbon now is amended into soils in a way that is resilient to decomposition, which is different than if it was going in as a, as a herbaceous or as a organic material, which doesn't last very long in the soil. But carbon biochar lasts for hundreds to thousands of years which effectively moves carbon stock from the atmosphere using photosynthesis into the soils. I mean, that's the explanation. Yeah. Um, and then there was a question about uh, what, what would you say is more efficient, uh, uh, the co-application of biochar with cow dung manure or chicken manure, if you have any information on, on that? Anything? Not yet, but uh, we, just, we just promote both as much as possible in as large as scale as possible. Um, so there are too many questions coming now, so I have to uh, choose some. Um, how far, uh, so a question from Hans-Jörg Blechenmüller, um, how far advanced is, is your production plant and when will your production start? Production plant is in early design mode. We're still actually even working on some of the uh, technology uh, selection for it. And we're also working on the funding for the plant. So these are all in formative stages. And what, what was the second question? Or the second part of that? Just when, when, you're, when you believe your production will start. We're 
we, are, we believe in the next couple of years, <laughs> but it all depends on the speed at which we can acquire the funding for this, the plant that is going to be located in Alberta. And then there's, there's a follow-up question to that from Paul Anderson. So what pyrosis technology or device uh, are you using to make your biochar and how are you using the heat? Okay, well, um, I, what I can tell you is that there's a couple different um, pyrolytic processes, as you know, Paul. Um, and so one is a, a you know, a updraft kiln method, which is a continuous process. And the other is a rotating kiln possibility where you have the indirect heating of the rotating kiln. Uh, what, what we're selecting may actually be a hybrid between those two. So partially updraft, uh, updraft and partially rotating kind of kiln. So, these are all things that are in, in, in the works at this point. But um, yeah, there's, there's, there's a number of different ways and, and uh, we're, we're selecting what we believe is the optimum. Okay, thank you. And um, I have a, a, a finishing question to you. So what, what would you say is the uh, potential issues that could come up with the exponentially growing biochar market? Do you see any downsides because we saw that 10 years ago that um, the biology industry did a lot of things in the wrong way and then somehow didn't uh, grow anymore. So do you, do you see anything similar coming up right now? Yeah, so what I'm seeing is, as I mentioned in the last portion of what I just uh, shared with you, is that there will likely be significant competition for available sustainably harvested residual biomass and in, in, the, in the case of biochar the, the highest quality biochar is made from from a woody feedstock so it's woody residuals but i believe that that will get sorted out purely as a matter of economics and um as as the biochar credits for bio uh, credits for biochar become prevalent and um large large cons large uh, customers of those credits uh, encourage the industry I believe that the biochar industry will be uh, propelled uh, as quickly as the, the BEX industry use of, of those residuals. So it may actually be a little bit of a tug of war between BEX and biochar for a little while, but I believe biochar will win that, will win that tug of war over time as the market for biochar expands. So let's, let's hope that. Um, we know there are some open questions for the carbon capture technology. Um, thank you very much, Rob. Um, okay, you're welcome.